Welcome to Green Dot Daily. I'm Maria Marino, live every weekday at 3 Eastern on the Action app. And if you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to our channel. On today's show, we'll talk NHL with Tim Kalinowski and Premier League with BJ Cunningham and Anthony DeBundo. But we start with a whole lot of March Madness. And somebody is on fire. Our predictive analyst, Nick Giffen, is up over 28 units with a 46 and 19 record or about a 71% win rate on his NCAA men's tournament player props. Woo! And lucky for us, Nick Giffen joins us now. Okay, which game are you looking at for your first prop of the night? Yeah, we're going to start with my. NC State Wolfpack. Uh, I went to grad school there and uh, got my math PhD from there. Go Pack. Uh, against Marquette. But I'm not taking an NC State over. I'm actually taking an NC State under. It doesn't mean I don't like the pack. It's it's more <laughs> of a uh, uh, a situation where DJ Burns Jr. under five and a half rebounds, which I'm getting at minus 105, uh, just has a little bit of teammate vulturism. So we'll talk about that. But First of all, DJ Burns Jr. is coming off of a ceiling game of 11 rebounds against a bad shooting Oakland team. He played 42 minutes in a game that went into overtime. Uh, but aside from that Oakland game, DJ Burns Jr. hasn't played more than 31 minutes since literally last year, right? December 16th, 2023. <laughs> so earlier this season, but technically calendar year uh, uh, last year. And prior to that Oakland game, he stayed under this number in 31 of the 37 other games this year. Uh, and five of those six overs uh, were prior to the emergence of teammate Muhammad Diara. This is what I was talking about here. The kind of the emergence of Diara is another reason to back Burns is under here. Uh, and Diara has played 31 or more minutes in each of the last six games. Diara has a 31% defensive rebound rate this year. That is third in the nation among all players. So, you know, you think 362 teams, five starters, a few bench players. That's a lot of players. He's third in the nation in defensive <laughs> rebound percentage among all of them, plus a 10% offensive rebound rate. So that's just vulturing a bunch of boards that DJ Burns used to get when DR was playing fewer minutes earlier in the season. And also in that Oakland game that we were talking about, DR fouled out. So he played you know, fewer minutes than he probably could or should have played as well. Now, turning to the matchup here against Marquette, they aren't a good rebounding team, so that does, in theory, help Burns, but Marquette is the 15th best team in the nation in terms of effective field goal percentage, so they are making a lot of their shots. So that's why we're projecting Burns for four and a half rebounds with around a 68% chance to stay under five and a half. So, you know, you can play this down beyond minus 150 or so and still feel pretty comfortable. You mentioned the 11 boards against Oakland. He grabbed just one in the first round against Texas Tech. And you can still technically root for NC State and Diara to just grab more of the rebounds. Exactly. Yeah, and we so. are technically showing some some value on Diara's over as well. We hit that last time mm -hmm. NC State played. Uh, not, it, it is some value there. It's not massive value, but uh, that would be, you know, something. When we talk about betting overs, we like to root for our player to bet over. But when we bet unders, we're like, what do we root for? Well, in this case, root for Diara to grab boards. That's what we can root I for as a way to support the DJ Burns under. Very nice. And for what it's worth, I am in solidarity with you betting NC State on the women's side to do we well. Go. But which other prop caught your eye for tonight on the men's side? Yeah, this is uh, one I've been going to a handful of times this year, and this is in the Creighton versus Tennessee game. And we're going to take Creighton's big man, Ryan Kalkbrenner, under half a steal. In other words, zero steals we want uh, for <laughs> minus 140. Now, I know that sounds like a lot of juice, but look, he has 13 steals this whole season. Uh, and in three of those games, he had two steals, which means he's only had a steal in 10 out of 34 games this year. So he's only cleared this just 10 times, less than a third of the time, right? That would be more than minus 200 odds uh, if that were his long-term rate. And I think there's a reason it should be at least that versus Tennessee. First of all, he gets matched up against uh, Tennessee's big Jonas Idu, who has the 172nd lowest turnover rate in all of college basketball. 172nd, again, may not sound that low, uh, but again, think there's several thousand NCAA <laughs> basketball players. That's pretty darn good. And a lot of those guys that have low turnover rates are swingmen or, or guards. 
Jonas Idu has one of the lowest period among starting centers. So it's a really bad matchup for Kalkbrenner to be able to uh, get steals here. And that's when I do gets the ball because Tennessee as a whole, they kind of live in the mid mid range off that pick and roll. Uh, I think we'll see a lot of Dalton connect tonight. Uh, and they also shoot a lot from outside. 41% of their shots come from beyond the arc. So Cockburner may not even be called on a whole bunch here uh, defensively because Tennessee's mid range and, and outside game should dominate here. So uh, our projections have Cockburner for 0.45 steals. And I do think that's a little bit generous, but even using that 0.45 steals, I'm getting around a little over a 68% chance of him staying under. Again, I think that's generous. I'd say he's more like 70 to 75% to stay under half a steal, just based off some matchup intuition as well. Very nice. Well, he had a pair of steals in the second round against Oregon, but zero in the first round versus Akron. Now, as a bonus, we have NASCAR this weekend, and you have a pick there as well. Yeah, going to my home track, Richmond Raceway for the Toyota Owners 400. Uh, and we're going to go with Carson Hosevar. Uh, he's a rookie driver for Spire Motorsports to finish as the top Chevy driver at 35 to 1. So a little sprinkle here. Uh, and the reason I like this is at Phoenix, which is the most similar track that we've raced to so far this year to Richmond, he finished as the fourth best Chevy driver, but he's being priced as the eighth or ninth uh, Chevy across most books. And, you know, he, in that race at Phoenix, he finished 14th, but that was literally directly behind two Chevys, Daniel Suarez finishing 12th and Kyle Larson finishing 13th. So, um, you know, was battling for second Chevy honors there only really clearly behind Ross Chastain, who finished six as the top Chevy in that race. And if we look at host in the truck series, which is kind of a lower, one of the lower series compared to the NASCAR cup series, which is the top series, um, host of had a win at Richmond and Richmond's also a high tire wear track, and he's done great at high tire wear tracks. He has that win at Richmond, like I said, at the truck series. He also won at Homestead, which is a high tire wear one and a half mile track. And at Darlington, which is a one and a third mile track, high tire wear, he has second and third place finishes. So my model has Hosevar closer to like 25 to one is fair value. So 30 or 35 to one that I've seen out there. Uh, definitely some, some value. It's not like monstrous value, but it's good enough mm -hmm. that I'm willing to take a, a stab here on the rookie Carson Hosevar. Well, you can catch more of Nick's NASCAR picks on the podcast Running Hot, which you are certainly doing, Nick. So keep it up. Thanks for joining the show. Yeah, thank you. And uh, go pack. Go pack. Hey, if you've ever wanted to try the best version of the Action app, that time is now because we're running a special offer on Action Pro. To celebrate the NCAA tournament, you can try Pro Access for just $9.99 for the first month. With Action Pro, you get our biggest betting model edges, real-time money percentages, data-driven systems, NCAA tournament player prop projections from the predictive analytics team of Sean Kerner and Nick Giffen and lots more. Just visit actionnetwork.com slash madness to take advantage before this deal expires. That's actionnetwork.com slash madness. Let's stick with the men's NCAA tournament here and preview each matchup as we say hello to Anthony DeBundo and Mike Calabrese. You guys have picks on the later games. But first on the docket is 11 seed NC State against two seed Marquette. DeBundo, can the Wolfpack keep up this run they're on? You know, Marquette is a vulnerable high seed. They have a, a, a rebounding margin that's pretty low, and it hurts their, their ability to withstand variance. Their shot volume numbers are not that impressive. And so Marquette is a team that coming into the tournament I was pretty low on. But I do think they have a matchup advantage here, which is they're just going to put DJ Burns, the big for NC State, in pick and rolls all night and Kolek and Igadara are so good in those settings uh, and Burns, you know, his size makes him a difficult player to guard these pick and rolls. So I think it's a huge advantage for them, but then also on the other side, I mean, I think NC state offensively, you know, the, the defense has kind of led the resurgence for NC state because they've been defending the perimeter much better, but offensively with Burns, Marquette loves to double the post. We saw that in the Colorado game. They doubled Lampkin to a lot of uh, positive turnovers and and really ran off of that. It was very effective. But Burns is so much better in the post at passing out of doubles and making the right decision uh, that they're going to leave a lot of open shooters and they're going to struggle on the glass. So I think there's paths to success for both offenses. Um, I lean toward the over here, but no, no play for me. Just going to watch this one as a fan. Fair enough. Well, next up, we have the five seed Gonzaga 
their nine straight, straight sweet 16 straight sweet. That's a, a bit of a tongue twister, but anyway, take it on the one seed Purdue breeze. What are you expecting here? So I'm leaning a little bit with Purdue. I think the number's just about right. It's why I don't have an official play. I'm probably going to use the money line as a sweetener and some parlays. And the reason's pretty simple. I think Purdue is one of the most complete teams in the entire country, third in Ken Palm offense, 15th in defense. And the MO on them last year was that you could speed them up, get them out of their comfort zone in a slower half-court game, and that's when you could take advantage of them. That just hasn't been the case this year. They played really well when playing at a faster pace than normal. And because of that, I think you're getting to see all the weapons they have. It's not just Edie. Edie barely did anything in the second half against Utah State, and they still ran away from an Aggies team that spent the majority of the season in the top 25. And reason for that is they're second nationally in assist-to-made basket ratio. So they share the ball really well. Their backcourt with Braden Smith is a lot better than it was last year, certainly in the tournament. And as you know, time goes on, I think he's hopefully going to get healthier coming off that injury in the Big Ten tournament. He's already been a facilitator in this tournament, but his scoring has dipped a little bit. So I still think their ceiling's a little bit higher if he can give them 15 plus points. And then when I look at the Zags, my issue is outside of EK, can they get consistent scoring on the perimeter? Nolan Hickman is my issue and the reason why I'm not interested in taking Mark Few's team plus the points here. Against ranked opponents, they played six games. He's averaged just 10.5 points per game, shot 40% from the field and only 29% from three. They need him to be borderline special and to go for 20 plus points in a game like this to get over a number one seed. And I just don't see it. So as I mentioned, I'm probably going to go with Purdue on the money line as a sweetener in some parlays. Interesting. Okay, good strategy. Well, moving on to Duke, the four seed against Houston, another one seed. Breeze, this is where you do have an official pick. So it's interesting, kind of talking myself in and out of this game on both sides of it. Why not just land right in the middle? Take this game to be decided by one to five points in either direction, and it's plus 165 in the market. And the reason why I think the underdog is live here is Duke has the formula to beat a team like Houston. They love to play slower. This isn't some of the up-tempo Coach K teams of the last 10 years. This is a new kind of Duke team that prefers to play slower. They're top 10 nationally when playing in lower possession games than normal. Very low turnover rate, and that's critical against a Houston defense that plays exhaustive on-ball defense. They're 50th in defensive rebounding percentage, so they're not going to get killed on the glass. And they have multiple knockdown shooters to take advantage of Houston playing a little bit overly aggressive on the perimeter and leaving some people open. Whereas Houston has steamed out of some really big leads in the past two months and then gone ahead and blown them and gone cold offensively against quality teams. So I don't think there's much risk of them necessarily running away with this game, particularly when you fold in the fact that they are really thin on their bench due to injuries. So whether it's foul trouble or someone gets dinged up in this game, all of a sudden you're going to see their rotation probably shrink to seven players. I think that's going to lead to you know a 40-minute battle and one of these two teams winning by fewer than two possessions. So I'll go ahead with the plus 165 on a close game. I have to say, good idea. This is something I wouldn't have thought of betting before. But the nightcap on the men's side is the three-seed Creighton against the two-seed Tennessee. Devundo, how are you betting it? Yeah, so I've kind of gone back and forth. Creighton plays one of the high, most high-variant styles in the entire sport. They shoot a lot of jump shots. They do not force turnovers. They do not get offensive rebounds. They are a low-shot volume offense, but they generate elite looks. They have elite shot makers. So it's a really fun matchup trying to handicap their games. And I think this ultimately comes down to how much is Tennessee able to run in transition? Because they are not as efficient in the half court. They have struggled at times. We saw them against Texas really struggle to, to consistently knock down shots, even when they had good looks. But really, both defenses elite at taking away the rim. Creighton elite at letting not letting teams run in transition on them. It's going to come down to a lot of jump shooting. And I think I like the under as a result of that, not only just the fewer possessions, but Creighton also seeing the athleticism that Tennessee has. I think JJJ, Josiah Jordan-James, big part of this matchup defensively, Meshack as well. Like those two guys can really alter uh, Creighton and all the ball screening that they do and make it more difficult for Creighton to get those open shots. They are so good at generating open looks on the perimeter with. So I think Creighton's offense maybe struggles a little more than normal, but also like Tennessee, yes, they can hit some mid-range looks. They can be effective there but it's a really tough way to live in this tournament and you're just not going to get anything at the rim against Kalkbrenner. And that's where Tennessee wants to get a lot of its offense from. So I like the under here. I know the over just took some money uh, up to 145 and a half. I disagree with it. I like the under uh, I'd play it down to 144. Okay. Well, Breeze, you are taking a side here. 
Yeah, I'm going to piggyback on what Debunda is saying. I think it will be a lower scoring game. And for that reason, I want to go ahead and take the points. And this is now shifted to the Blue Jays catching three and a half above that one possession number. I think that's critical against a Tennessee team that has struggled to cover numbers in March Madness. So you think about what Rick Barnes has done in his last 20 NCAA tournament games, four and 16 against the spread. That's horrific. And in a lot of cases, they've been favored in those games and they've struggled to put teams away. Just, you know, big picture, though, I look at the Vols. I think they peaked about a month ago, and it's a shame that they weren't headed into the NCAA tournament at the time because when you look at their last four games, they squandered a 40-point performance from Connect against Kentucky and an outright loss. They go to the SEC tournament in Nashville with a chance to get a number one seed. You look at it was either going to be them or North Carolina. They get bounced in the very first game against Mississippi State as a huge favorite. Then they nearly blow a double-digit second-half lead in their last game, the round of 32, against Texas. So, in my opinion, they're leaking oil. And I understand that Creighton was fortunate to get by Oregon in the last round. That's a game that they probably should have lost. All that really needed to happen was some more foul shots to go in for the Ducks at the end of regulation. But they are here. And as DeBundo points out, this is a team that can shoot their way past just about anybody in this field. They're going to take... Uh, probably 33s in this game if they make 10 or 11 i think all of a sudden this is going to be a game right down to the wire if they make more than that i think tennessee is going to be in big trouble because offensively if connect isn't special i still question tennessee beating really good teams down the stretch here so i three and a half is just too much to pass up so i'm going to go ahead with mcdermott catching the points yeah i tweeted this a couple weeks ago like when creighton's going good there's pretty much nobody better i mean they beat uconn by 20 in a game, you know, UConn's beaten everybody by 20 every game since. Uh, And they've also lost to Colorado State by 20 and got pretty well handled by Providence in the Big East tournament. So it really does come down to shot making. They have the guys to do it. But Tennessee elite doesn't allow a lot of open looks. I think that's what makes this game, uh, you know, a little little low scoring, grinded out kind of game. So much good basketball to take in tonight, fellas. Thank you for setting the stage for us. DeBundo, you're going to stick around, but Calabrese, we'll say bye for now. Thanks, Maria. And just a reminder to North Carolina residents, sports betting is now live and there are some awesome registration offers out there. So make sure to check out the link in the description or go to actionnetwork.com for specific offer codes. To soccer, where the three-way race continues as far as winning the Premier League, Manchester City has the shortest odds at plus 120, though they're third in the table right now, while Liverpool is at plus 200, currently in second place, and Arsenal is at plus 250 and in first place. However, the latter two have the same amount of points. As BJ Cunningham joins us along with Anthony DeBundo, all three of these teams play on Sunday, but the real showdown is Arsenal on the road at Man City. Since the results are certainly going to affect the odds, BJ, would you endorse making a title pick now? Yes. If you already haven't made a bet on Arsenal, I would endorse that right now. Yes. If you truly believe that they are going to win or potentially even get a draw from this match, because you know, Liverpool does have the easiest run in to the the end of the season, but they clearly have had some defensive issues. They're going to be playing in the in the Europa League as well. So um, there is a path where Arsenal, if they win this match, and even if Liverpool wins their match, where Arsenal is in pole position right now and would become the favorite to to win the Premier League. So if you're someone who believes that Arsenal could win this match, which I do believe they can, then yeah, I do believe there's some value on betting Arsenal to win the title. Okay, so tell us more about this whole belief in in Arsenal on Sunday. Right. So, you know, as you read off those odds, the market perception right now is that Manchester City is a far superior team to Arsenal, which a lot of data will suggest that that's just flat out not true. And yes, Manchester City is a better team at creating chances from open play than Arsenal. But Arsenal has now become the best out of possession team in the world with their high press. And Manchester City is in a very precarious position right now because they are going to be without two of their best defenders, John Stones and Kyle Walker. John Stones is incredibly important to Manchester City because when they are in possession, he is the one that inverts into the middle of the field alongside their defensive midfielder, Rodri. And he really helps them in their ability to build out of the back because they want to play through the middle of the pitch. They'll build out in some type of, you know, 3-2, 3-2 just trying to control that middle part of the pitch. Arsenal is one of the best teams at denying that space and pressing high. Without Stones, that means that they're going to have to put Akanji in that role. And he hasn't played that role to the level of Stones. So that might force Manchester City to play more direct, which a lot of teams have not had success with 
against Arsenal. Arsenal is allowing the lowest long ball completion rate in the Premier League. They're the best defensive team by far, only allowing 0.64 non-penalty expected goals. Nobody's created over one and a half expected goals against them in any competition this season. So, you know, Arsenal does have some injuries themselves, which as they were recording this, it does look like Bakayo Saka and Gabriel Martinelli are getting closer to being probable to play in this match, which is really key to Arsenal because they, most of their attacks come from out wide. You know, a lot of teams like to attack, attack through the middle of the pitch because that's where the goals are. Well, Arsenal's two best attackers are their two wingers. So they get the ball to them naturally. And they're the ones that create from out wide. If those guys both play, which in the previous meeting that ended one zero Arsenal, which there wasn't really a lot going on, they didn't have outlets because Saka didn't play and Martinelli came on at halftime. But when Martinelli did come on, Arsenal had that outlet and his ball carrying, his dribbling allowed Arsenal to at least create something in Manchester City's final third. So both these teams really want to have control of this match. I'm just not sure City's going to be able to do it because Arsenal this season out of possession, they're winning 75% of second balls since the middle of the season. So they're controlling matches out of possession and both in possession. So I think this match sets up really well for them. They have a better expected goal differential than Manchester City. They're significantly better defensively. So I I don't under I mean, I understand the betting market, but I don't really agree with it. So I like Arsenal plus a half here at minus one ten. And if you think that Arsenal's gonna win this match, there's value on them to bet to, to bet them to win the title. Quite the case BJ has made for Arsenal, but the bundo, let's get you involved here. Do you agree with this logic logic as far as their ability to not only win Sunday, but then putting them in position to win the Premier League? Yeah, so since fans returned in the post-COVID world, City has lost two matches in the Premier League in three years at home, uh, and it's mostly built on their defensive numbers. Now, it is true that their defensive numbers have not been nearly as elite this year, but we're talking in like very thin margins here. We're talking about instead of giving up 0.6 XG per 90, it's closer to like 0.8. Uh, and so there is a notable difference, and I think the betting markets have picked up on it. These two teams played last spring. I think that's the most intuitive match. City closed minus 175 that day. Now, Arsenal was a little shorthanded in attack, but now City's only about minus 110. So you're seeing that market has corrected in the last year. The Arsenal's getting more respect. City, a little bit less respect. Uh, we haven't seen City close this low at home in multiple years now in the Premier League. Not since two years ago against Liverpool uh, when Liverpool was priced about as good as Man City. So I, I don't think that the market is underrating Arsenal. I think they're getting respect, uh, but I do think the injuries are a concern for City. I agree with what BJ said with Rodri, uh, you know, having to carry the load. He didn't play in the last meeting. The last meeting between these two teams in the fall at Arsenal, there was 0.9 total XG created. It was a very, very dull watch. It was two managers, Arteta for Arsenal, who is a disciple of Pep, who, who coached under him, mm. wanting to kind of emulate his style. And that has led to some pretty dull matches between these two teams where it's kind of a stalemate. Neither team wants to make the mistake. And this is more of a can't lose than a must win. I know it's like a joke, but it's true. In a three-way mm. title race with Liverpool there, you don't want to be the odd team out. And so by not losing this match, I think both teams kind of gain. Like if you told City before this match, you're going to get a draw, they'd probably be a little disappointed. But I don't think they'd be devastated because they feel that over the next eight matches, nine matches, where nobody plays anybody in the top three, they're going to get the most points. And I think a fully healthy city would get the most points. And thus, that's why they're the favorites. Mm. That's why I like under two and a half. Uh, there's still even money out there. That's about as low as I would play it. I know that the attacking talent is crazy in this game, but BJ's right about Arsenal's defense. Number one in all of Europe, uh, the preventing chances. And I talked about City at home. They give up about half of an XG per match. So it's an elite offense, uh, elite defense at home. Uh, and and they just don't lose matches there. So I think this could play out like a 1-0, 1-1 kind of game. I think Arsenal's certainly live to get a result. I just find it hard to go against City at this number when it's literally the lowest price they've been at home in multiple years. So that's where I'm kind of at on this. Uh, I have City around minus 122. So, you know, I think the line's about right, but I like the mm. under. And, you know, the injuries for Arsenal do concern me with their attack because Saka is the fulcrum of this entire Arsenal attack. If he's not there, it hurts. Okay, so we have your strategy as far as betting the match. Full disclosure for anyone who hasn't listened to Wonder Goal, have you put in a future <laughs> between these three clubs? Just just put it out yeah, there. I mean, I have Liverpool from 
a little while ago, uh, a few mm-hmm. months ago. BJ has Arsenal. Yeah, uh, he has well, we them. got that part. <laughs> yeah, BJ, BJ, an Arsenal fan, has been on them since the beginning of the year. I'll give him credit. Yes. Uh, he, I think he gave them out what, seven to one or, or something like that back in August. You know, that's how long this has been going. Liverpool, for me, I had a notch above Arsenal. I think it's like pretty much a coin flip between those two. The thing okay. has always been, and this was the case last year, City started a little slow last year. Arsenal was in first. City got healthy and they they turned into this unbeatable juggernaut in the second half. We have not seen them fully reach that level. We saw some vulnerabilities at Liverpool a couple weeks ago when City played there. But City, you know, the joke last year I kept saying on our pod was every time you see City at plus money every week, just keep adding more to your profile. (laughs) I have not really said that this year as much. I've been hesitant. I have not fired on City to win the league because I think there are some cracks uh, and and you're seeing it in the market as well. All right. A little more vulnerable, perhaps. We'll see what happens this weekend. It's going to be a fun one. Guys, good luck. Thanks for joining the show. Thanks Thanks for having us. Well, look what we have here. Who might that be? I guess it's our hockey expert, Tim Kalinowski. And what's that he's holding? That appears to be a state championship trophy from the high school hockey team where he is an assistant coach. Congratulations to Tim. And you join us now, Tim. How does it feel to be a state champ? Well, I'll say this. Um, You know, I I was giving a lot of attention to the team during the the playoff run and um, my work may have slipped here and there, but it's now actually even worse now that we won because everything I do, I'm like, um, you know, do I want to have a drink on a Wednesday night? I'm like, yeah, screw it. I'm a state champion. I can do whatever I want. I'm like, should I do laundry today? I'm a state champion. I don't have to do laundry. So uh, I don't know when this is really going to end, but uh, I, f- I feel like I'm spiraling more uh, out of control po- post win because I can just justify everything with, hey, I'm a state champion. I can do what I want. Well, look, you're riding high and we're okay with that. We're going to ride high along with you, but let's talk a little NHL, shall we? and some teams on the playoff bubble in the Eastern Conference. we got the Flyers, Capitals, Red Wings, to name a few. Would you bet any of these teams to be in or out? Listen, Flyers fans, I know the standings don't look great. I know it looks like a slip. The the Capitals are are on their heels for the last spot in the Metro Division, and you know possibly their playoff chances could be at risk. But I would say with the Flyers being at minus 330 for yes – that is pretty reflective of their actual true odds to make it flyers fans. I would say do not panic. That's why I have my flyers hat on right here. Listen, they, they had a really tough part of their schedule uh, over the last two weeks. And everyone was saying, this is when they fall out of it. And, you know, they did a well enough job in holding serve. They forced some games to overtime to make sure that they got a point. And I think that we're kind of forgetting that they did a good job, I think, uh, navigating that. And now their schedule significantly softens up compared to the other teams. I think the real wild card here is the New Jersey Devils. Uh, they play Buffalo tonight, and they're a, a favorite at Buffalo. They're currently plus 850 to make the playoffs uh, on bet 365. And I thought about maybe a little sprinkle on that because, you know, if you want the Flyers to make the playoffs, for instance, who wants to lay in a future minus 330? I I consulted with my friends online, Chage, Nick Martin and Michael Leboff, and they said, you're better off just betting uh, New Jersey rather game by game because they're going to have to go nearly perfect here uh, for them to have a chance. So I think that was a good piece of advice for them from them. Definitely. Okay, so the key takeaways are, Flyers fans, don't panic and keep an eye on the Devils. Maybe consider betting them game to game. Uh, Speaking of betting on a per game basis, we do have a full slate of games on Saturday. What's your best bet of the day? I like the LA Kings at the Calgary Flames. This is a, a 10 p.m. start, so I know it's a March Madness day, but and baseball's uh, in full force. But listen, if you want a little hockey sprinkle, I, I would say the LA Kings minus 148 at DraftKings right now. I'd say I like it up to minus 160. Uh, Calgary is a team that they have lost nine in a row, and. Speaking of of baseball, I like when uh, some of our baseball experts lay out pitchers that they want to back this season and pitchers that they don't want to back. I'm kind of doing the same thing with teams right now that are playing out the string, teams that I want to still back and teams that I don't. There's some teams that have been feisty here despite um, really being in the bottom of the standings. 
Uh, but Calgary is the complete opposite. They have lost nine in a row. They look like a team playing out the string. They look disinterested. Uh, they just had a dud playing uh, the St. Louis Blues at St. Louis. They lost to the Blackhawks before that. So now they come back home. LA's already in Alberta after a loss to the Oilers last night. But I still think that the LA Kings are getting a little undervalued because I think a lot of people just have in their head that horrible string they had in late December into January. Um, a lot of talk has been on some of the other teams in the West, but the LA Kings are still a, a much better team than the, the Calgary Flames. And I'm willing to lay it here at the minus 148, probably like it up to minus 160, let's say. Okay, very nice. I don't mind after watching hoops all day, maybe winding down to some hockey. I feel like you can't really go wrong there. But Tim, thank you. Oh, Marie, of course, and, and good luck to everyone betting all the hoops, men, women's, the baseball, the hockey. Should be a tremendous weekend of me once again justifying I can do whatever I want. I'm a state champion. Absolutely. <laughs> Remember, any picks we give out here on the show, you can easily reference by following Green.Daily in the Action app. We keep track so you don't have to. That's all for Green Dot Daily. I'm Maria Marino. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you again Monday at 3 Eastern on the Action app and YouTube channel. Enjoy the weekend.